Brothers and sisters, I would like to tell you once again that Jesus is coming again. And as we've been looking at some signs of the times, and as I mentioned the other night, one of the signs of the times is when the prophet of God, the true prophet of God, when you see that prophet or prophetess is under attack. As Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 24, the signs of the times, the very first sign as we looked at the other night was false prophets that will arise and the majority will accept these false prophets. But while the majority are accepting, embracing these false prophets, again, as I mentioned before, you should uh, see a movement arising against the true prophet of God. And this is part of the loud cry message. We are going to deal once again with Ellen White, who was the true prophet of God. Indeed, as we are about to see, Matthew 24, the signs of the times are being fulfilled because she has been greatly under attack. How many of you here believe that she was a true prophet or prophetess? If you don't know her too well, I advise you to start reading the testimonies. Amen? Read the text testimonies and compare what she has written there with the Word of God. She calls herself the lesser light, which we'll deal with a little bit tonight. She called herself the le lesser light. Now, this is one of the uh, passages that her critics would take and use against her, lesser light. They said, well, we don't need to uh, use Ellen White. We have the Bible because she was the lesser light. But keep in mind that each one of the prophets... What did I say? Each one of the prophets that we find within the pages of scriptures, from Genesis, that would be Moses, all the way down to Revelation, that would be the Apostle John. All of them, each one of them, represents singularly a lesser light. Did you hear what I say? Each one of them represents a lesser light. So when you bring all of them together, now you have the greater light and that greater light is not really them is really Jesus Christ because all of them collectively come together to represent Jesus Christ Jeremiah was a lesser light by himself Moses was a lesser light by himself Ezekiel was a lesser light by himself likewise Ellen White was a lesser light by herself but you Bring her writings together with the Bible, then you have the greater light. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Lord, Father God in heaven, we want to thank you this afternoon once again. While it's still Sabbath and we can still enjoy this beautiful day, we want to thank you that we can meet together here right now peacefully while we have this opportunity to learn at your feet. Now, as we break the word of life once again, we pray, Father, that you would help us like those who heard the apostle speak in Acts chapter 2. And they ask, what must I do to be saved? And help us, Father, as we read, as we hear, to ask the same question because we want to be in the kingdom. We want to be saved. Forgive us, Father, of all our sins, we pray. Now, Bless our minds with understanding of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Now, you don't need to turn there. I am pretty sure that you know this passage very well. What does it say? And the dragon was wroth with the woman. What did he do? He, make, he went to make war with whom? With the remnant of her seed, why? Why? Because they keep the commandments of God and what else? They have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now for those of you who are not too familiar with Revelation 19, let's turn there. Revelation 19, verse 10. This helps us to understand what the Spirit of prophecy is. 
Revelation 19.10. And what does it say there? John says, And I fell at his feet. That's the angel's feet. Which would be Gabriel there. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, the angel said unto John, See thou do it not. Why? I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the what again? Testimony. The testimony of Jesus. It's the same testimony of Jesus that we find in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. What else? Worship God for the what? The testimony of Jesus is the what? It's the spirit of prophecy. So when we read Revelation 12, 17, where it says once again, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? It's the spirit of prophecy. Now turn to Revelation chapter 22. Where you are in Revelation, just a couple pages over. Revelation chapter 22. Notice with me, again, same account. John is talking to the same angel, which is Gabriel. Verse 8 of chapter 22. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou, do it not. Apparently, John had forgotten there. In chapter 19, the angel said the same thing there. See thou, do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Now, if you read carefully here, this is what the Bible tells us to do. This is how we study the Bible, especially when it comes to Bible prophecies. You, we compare scriptures with scriptures, here a little, there a little, right? We just quoted Revelation 12, 17. It says, the saints, the remnant will keep the, the commandments of God and have the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19, 10 tells us the spirit of prophecy is what? The, or the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy, right? Now, what is the spirit of prophecy? Well, chapter 22, just explain what it is. Let's read it one more time. In verse 9, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the, the what? The prophets. the prophets. There's the key there. The prophets. And then it says, And of them which keep the saying of this book, worship God. So the same account, the same thing that happened in chapter 19, when that angel told John, Do not worship me, I'm just a fellow serv servant who has the gift of prophecy, who comes to help you to understand prophecies. So the spirit of prophecy or the gift of prophecy tells us these are prophets that God has raised to help his people to understand. Now, Daniel 8.14 tells us, unto 2,300 days shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now let me take a moment to explain something here before we move on. Before God does anything, as we mentioned. Before he does anything, he always raises a prophet, as we mentioned this morning. But also, whenever there is a time prophecy, what did I say? A time prophecy. Whenever God gives a time prophecy, at the end of that time prophecy, he always raises a prophet to help his people to understand that this prophecy or this time prophecy has been fulfilled now, this is where we are, and this is where we're heading. This is what's coming. I'll give you some examples. Well, let me help you to understand it better. Let's say Enoch prophesied. Let's put it this way. Remember, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and also the book of Job. Moses wrote that book as well. Now, in the book of Genesis, Enoch prophesied that a flood was coming, judgment was coming. You can read that in the book of Jude as well. Don't ask me which chapter of the book of Jude because there's only one chapter. <laughs> now, <laughs> Enoch prophesied that a flood was coming. How did Enoch prophesy this? You remember? 
he called his son's name Methuselah. What does Methuselah mean? When he died, it will come. That's what the name Methuselah means. When he died, it will come. What was the it? The it was the flood. This is why in the book of Jude, it says Enoch prophesied of those things that a flood was coming. Now, let's skip over now. Also, in the book of Genesis, Abraham was given a vision by God. God says to Abraham that your descendant will be slave to a nation. And then God says after 400 years, what's the number there? 400 years, that I will bring them out. Now, obviously, this is referring to the children of Israel in bondage uh, to the Egyptians, right? In the Egyptians' bondage. But was that a time prophecy? Yes. God says to Abraham, they will be there for 400 years there in Egypt. Now, at the end of that prophecy, what happened? Can you tell me what happened? God raised a prophet. Who was the prophet? Moses was the prophet. God raised Moses as a prophet and then to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. It was at the end of that time prophecy. Now, another one. God gave a prophecy to Jeremiah to give to the people. He said through Jeremiah that Israel was going to be in captivity to the Babylonian for a period of 70 years. You remember that prophecy, right? Question. Who was the prophet at the end of the 70 years that God raised to tell the people that the time prophecy has been fulfilled? This is where we are. Daniel was the prophet. Remember, Daniel was, was studying and he understood that the prophecy had, of Jeremiah had been fulfilled. Now, Daniel himself was given some time prophecies. Like, for example, the 2300 days, right? And what else? What's another time prophecy Daniel was given? The 490 years prophecy, the 70 weeks prophecy. Remember? The 70 weeks prophecy pointed to whom? Talk to me now, come on. Not just Israel, but it pointed to whom? To Jesus. The 490 years prophecy pointed to the time Jesus was going to come. But prior to Jesus coming, into the scene to present himself. Did God raise a prophet to let them know that 490 years was about to expire? John the Baptist, very good. Now, th this is how you find it in the Bible. Whenever there is a time prophecy, God always raises a prophet at the end of that time prophecy to help the people understand where they are. This is why when John the Baptist came, there was such an urgency. He was trying to point them back to the prophecies of Daniel, that the time prophecies are being fulfilled. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now, the same Daniel also was given, as I mentioned, another time prophecy, the 2300 days, a day for a year, according to Numbers chapter 4. When did that end? October 22nd, 1844. Now, Based on what we just looked at here or talked about here, should we expect God to raise a prophet at the end of the hundred and uh, yeah, the time prophecy, the 2300 days? Yes. Did God raise a prophet? Yes. December 1844. That was Ellen White. Now, when we look at the consistency of the way God works, we cannot say, we cannot have doubt in the prophetic gifts of Ellen White. You understand what I'm saying? At the end of each time prophecy, God always raises a prophet. Now, should we expect that prophet to come under attack the same way John the Baptist came under attack, the same way Daniel came under attack, the same way the prophets before Daniel, even Jeremiah, came under attack. Even Moses himself came under attack. Now, this is what we're going to look at. Notice this statement on the screen here. This tells us here from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 8. Through holy angels, God revealed to Enoch his purpose to destroy the world by a flood. And he also opened more fully to him the what? 
the plan of redemption. Now, Enoch was called a prophet. Okay, notice. By the spirit of what? Of prophecy, he carried him. He carried, God carried Enoch down through the generations that should live after the flood and showed him the great events connected with the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. Now, again, you go to the book of Jude, you can also read more about Enoch there. How God revealed these things, as she mentioned there, to Enoch from the flood and all the way down to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? God, like in the days or after the days of Enoch, he raised a prophet to warn the people of what was coming. By the way, remember, Noah was also a prophet that was raised to tell the people this is what's coming. Judgment was coming, but God had provided a way out of it. And that's, that's the ark. In spite of the fact that we hear about calamities, wars, and rumors of wars, and all of these things, and the judgment of God that, that are imminent, but God today has an ark for you and I. And what's that ark? That is Jesus Christ. That's the ark today. He has, once again, provided a remedy. This is the reason why Christ says, Come unto me, all ye that are what? Heavy laden. And what will he do for you and I? He will give us rest. Come unto him. This is the call. This is the urgency. This is part of the loud cried message to come unto Jesus before that door of mercy is, is forever shut. God was the one who shut the door of the ark. Noah was not the one who did that. And this is the reason why they could not open that door when probation closed for them. If you deny the prophet, if you reject the prophet of God, then you are in big trouble. Next quote here. Let's look at this next quote. The prophecy of Revelation 12, 17 points out clearly that the remnant church will acknowledge God and His law and will have the prophetic what? Gift. Obedience to the law of God and the what again? The spirit of prophecy has always distinguished the true people of God and the test is usually given on present manifestation. Now, let's deal with this idea that Ellen White was the lesser light. Now, before we do this, you remember what we read and what she just quoted there in Revelation 12, 17? The expression have, the remnant, the seed, will, will have, keyword there, have, the what again? What will they have? The spirit of prophecy. Now the word have there, it's the same word that is used. Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 1. It is the same word that is used there in Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 we are looking at. Revelation 1 verse 18, are you there or are you heading there? Notice the Bible says, Christ is speaking, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore. Amen. And uh, here's the word, same word that was used in Revelation 12, 17. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now you can also find the same word, well as a matter of fact, we can go there, chapter 3 this time, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and uh, the seven stars. I know thy works. And what else? That thou hast a name. That thou livest and are what? And are dead. The word that we just read here, half, it's the same word that was used to have. To, which means to, to possess something. That's the word there. It means to possess something which is part of you. That is part of the remnant, the gift of prophecy. Also in the book of John, chapter 5, verse 26. John chapter 5, verse 26. Notice what the Bible tells us in John chapter 5, verse 26. We are having little Bible study here. Notice, the Bible says in verse 26, For as the Father, Jesus says, hath, that's the word there, hath life in himself, so hath 
he given to the Son to have life in himself. It's the same Greek word that was used in Revelation 12, 17. They have the spirit of prophecy. So this is something sure that we can count on. Amen? So again, let's look at this idea. As Sister White mentioned that she was the what again? She was the lesser light. Let's go to John. We looked at that passage this morning. Chapter 1. John chapter 1. Notice carefully with me in chapter 1, verse 6. This is speaking of John the Baptist. The Bible says, There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the what? Of the light, that all men through him might believe. But John the Baptist was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. What is that light? That is Jesus Christ. So in other words, what this is telling us here, John the Baptist was just a little light or a lesser light pointing to the greater light, which is Jesus Christ. Amen? Notice, let's look at another passage. Go to chapter 5 again of the same book. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 35. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 35. Notice carefully. Here a little, there a little. Let's compare scriptures with scriptures. Verse 35 says, Christ is speaking. He was a burning and a shining light. He's speaking of whom now? He's speaking of John. If you go back, well, as a matter of fact, let's go back. Let's go back to verse 31. If I bear witness of myself, Christ says, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, that is John. And I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from men, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. Then he says, he was a burning, John was, a burning and a shining light. Well, John was called a shining light, but was he the greater light? No, notice. And ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Notice carefully the context here. In his light. That's John's light. But notice what Christ is about to say. But I have what? Greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father have done what? Have sent me. Me. In other words, again, Christ is saying that John was just a little light pointing to the greater light. Likewise, Sister White was just a little light pointing to the greater light. Notice carefully what she says here on the screen. The Lord has sent his people much instruction, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. He is given to the Bible. And the Lord has given a, what's the word or the words? A lesser light to lead men and women to the womb. Greater light. Oh, how much good would be accomplished if the books containing this light were read with a determination to carry out the principles they contain. There would be a thousandfold greater vigilance, a thousandfold more self-denial and resolute effort and many more would now be rejoicing in the light of present truth. So if we were studying the lesser light and we would really appreciate the greater light because the lesser light points to the great light. And John the Baptist, as we just mentioned here or read here, he was that less, lesser light as well, pointing the believers to the greater light. And he, has, he had also the gift of prophecy. John the Baptist had the spirit of prophecy as well. Notice the next quote here. From Desire of Ages, page 220. The prophet John was the connecting link between the two dispensations. As God's representative, he stood forth to show the relation of the law 
and the prophets to the Christian dispensation. He was what? John was what? The lesser light, which was to be followed by what? By a greater. And who is the greater? That's Jesus Christ. The mind of John was illuminated by the Holy Spirit. That means he had the gift of prophecy. He had the spirit of prophecy. Again, the mind of John was illuminated by the Holy Spirit that he might shed light upon his people. But no other light ever has shone or ever will shine so clearly upon fallen men as that which emanated from the teaching and example of who? Of Jesus Christ and his mission and had been but dimly understood as typified in the shadowy sacrifices. This is the reason why there was such an urgency. John's messages were similar to that of Revelation 18 that we quoted and read before. It was a loud cried message. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. When God raises a prophet, he raises them for many reasons. Number one, to warn the people of judgment that was coming, but to call them to repentance, but also to help them to understand better the love of Jesus Christ for sinful creatures like you and I. Amen? The love of Jesus Christ, because he loves us with an everlasting love. But at the same time, he will not violate your conscience, my conscience. If we plug our ears from hearing the warnings from the prophets or reading the warnings from the prophets, well, just because you close your eyes, you plug your ears, does not mean judgment will stop. It does not mean that what God has predicted will happen won't happen just because you can't hear it, you can't see it. No. This is a deception from the enemy. Next quote here, notice. This is from Selected Messages, volume 3, page 31. Besides the instruction in his word, the Lord has given special testimonies to his people, not as a new revelation, but that he may set before us the plain lessons of his word, that errors, what is it? That errors may be corrected. Let's pause. Question, what is one of the reasons why God has given us spirit of prophecy or the writings of Ellen White? What's, what's one of the reasons? That errors may be corrected. Now keep in mind, remember, the uh, pioneers, they just came out from what was called the Dark Ages, from darkness, spiritual darkness. It wasn't that long before 1844 that they had just came out of that darkness. There were many errors. They believe in many things that were not spiritually sound because of the Roman Catholic Church, because of that darkness that plunged in that era for 1,260 years. So little by little, gradually, God was revealing a little bit of truth to his people and to point them back to the Bible. That was the reason why the gift of prophecy was necessary. Part of the reason why it was necessary to correct errors, to correct many false understanding, preconceived ideas, to point us back to the Bible and the Bible only. Amen? To point us back to the Bible and the Bible only. That was part of the reasons. Let's go back to the screen again. Notice. Again, she says, besides the instruction in his word, the Lord has given special testimonies to his people, not as a new revelation, but that he may set before us the plain lessons of his word. That, notice, errors may be what? Corrected that the right way may be pointed out. The what? The right way may be pointed out. Does that sound like John the Baptist? Yeah, notice. That the right way may be pointed out that every soul may be without what? Excuse. So God wants us to understand the truth better, to see the truth better in its correct light, to appreciate it better. This is the reason why the Bible says 
sanctify them how? Through thy truth, thy word is truth. God has given us that lesser light to point us to the greater light. But as I mentioned before, there's always an attack against the prophet that God has raised. But notice what the Bible tells us here on the screen. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. What does it say there? Believe in the what? In the Lord your God. And what would happen? And you shall be established. And what else? Believe who? His prophets. And then what would happen? And you shall prosper. What does the word prosper mean? Progress. What else? Grow. Huh? Grow. Grow. What else? How, louder? Flourish. Flourish. Very good. That's another very good word. You shall prosper. That is God's intentions for you and I. That is God's plans for you and I. God said he doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. He said, turn from your wicked way. God is always appealing, and that's part of the reason why he raises prophets. To, he's appealing to you and I to choose the right way. But it's our choice. Notice next quote there from volume one of Selected Messages, page 48. Notice carefully what she says. There will be a what? A hatred kindle against the what? The testimonies, which is what? Satanic. The workings of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in them. For this reason, Satan cannot have, notice carefully, so clear a track to bring in his deceptions. Pause. What is stopping Satan from fully bringing out his deception? The spirit of prophecy. Do you see it? It's the spirit of prophecy. As long as there is that lesser light pointing to the greater light, Satan cannot fully bring about his deception. But if you remove the spirit of prophecy, if you attack the prophets, what do you have? Where there is no vision, what happened to the people? The people perish. Back to the screen, notice. For this reason, Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions if the warnings, notice, if, if the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. So if we take heed of the counsel, we will be able to stand against the uh, deceptions of the enemy. Right? This is what it means to put on the whole armor of God. But she also says there will be hatred in the last days against the testimonies, against the gift of prophecy. And she called it, this is something that is coming from Satan. She said it's satanic. Is that happening? Notice carefully with me. This is from Spectrum Magazine. And this headline is entitled LNG White and Me. Now, I'm going to read a little bit what this man had to say. Now, this man, he's an Adventist. He's in one of those countries in Europe. And he's not the only one who has been attacking Ellen White. But listen carefully what he's saying. He said, later this year, 2020, at the general conference session, delegates will have to vote on a statement about whether Ellen G. White's writings are, what are the words? Inspired by God and help to understand what the Bible says. Now, let's pause here for a moment to understand. Why would you bring that to a vote, first of all? Why would you bring that to a vote Huh? Why would you bring it to a vote? That's questioning the gift of prophecy. It doesn't matter if they vote, yes, she was inspired by God. It doesn't matter. But the fact that you dare bring it for a vote, you are already putting doubt in the mind of many. You are already questioning the prophet. Now, should we bring to, for a vote if Jesus was really the Messiah? Should we bring that to a vote as well? Where will it stop? As we just looked at here, John was the lesser light, pointing to the greater light. Likewise, Ellen White was the lesser light, pointing to the greater light. If you question the, 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 the prophets, you're not going to believe in Christ. If you question the prophets, you're not going to believe in Christ. 
Notice, let's keep reading. He went on to say, the text of the statement was translated into Latvian, which is the country where he, he is from, and posted on Facebook. Several commentators expressed their views that Ellen White was a what? A false prophet. Now, those commentators are where? Most of them are within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Notice. Again, several commentators expressed their views that Ellen White was a false prophet, was historical, and most likely, what are the words? A mentally ill person. I also enter into a discussion with my objections. However, after lengthy discussions, I came to the conclusion that once again, I have to look honestly at everything I can read and find in her articles and articles about her. After all, I have had, what are the words? Contradictory thoughts when reading Ellen White books too. Notice, let's continue, let's read. He says, like many Adventists in Soviet times, I was taught to look at E.G. White as a special messenger of God. The authors of other books could have been ignored, but not Mrs. White. I still remember those, what are the words? Gloomy feelings that took me as I read her writings. Gloomy feelings. I have already forgotten which book first came into my mind or my hands. It seems to have been a volume from the testimonies to the church. Those who have read will probably understand me. So many accusations and uh, what is the word? Reprimand. So many accusations from where? She's, he's referring to accusation coming from the writings of Sister White. In other words, he's saying that Ellen White was so negative. That's what he's saying. Notice, feeling that you are sinful and God does not like you so much. Is it at all possible to reach the standard of holiness she is writing about? She, he questioned that. At the time, I did not know that I was not the only one who was thrown into what? Madness by her books. I continued to read from time to time. I was a big bookworm, but I didn't enjoy them. Them? Her writings. He's referring to. Let's continue. And yet, I was lucky. Notice, how was he lucky? Notice, in early youth, in the midst of a deep crisis of faith, I discovered the doctrine of justification by faith. What he's trying to say here is very similar to what Luther discovered. Do you understand? Luther was a monk, right? Was within the Catholic Church and was taught about Catholicism. But then what did Luther discover? Justification by faith, remember? So he's saying that he found justification by faith not through the writing of Sister White now. Let's read, notice. It became the basis for my entire spiritual adventure. I also started reading E.G. White's writings with what? Glasses of justification by faith. My favorite author was who? Morris Venden. It was his books that gave me the opportunity to look at Christ with completely different eyes and also to look at what? E.G. White's writings from a different angle. Now, the authors that he's referring to here are also authors that question the gift of prophecy, the gift of Ellen White. Notice. And then, more than 20 years ago, Judge R. Knight's book reading Ellen White was published and translated into Latvian. I realized how silly, notice, how silly it is to ignore who, why, in what culture, and in what century anything is being written. In other words, what Sister White wrote, according to what he just said here, was for that time. It does not apply to us today. That's what he's saying. It was for that time. So we don't need to listen to these councils. He goes on to say, the statement scheduled for next year at the general conference session will only add to the disappointing numbers. 
This is inevitable. LNG White is not, notice carefully, is not the same as a Roman Catholic Pope was once considered. We groan at the statement that the Pope as deputy of God was never mistaken in his words and writings, but notice, at the same time, we appoint Ellen White an even holier place. Do you understand what he just said there? He said, we Adventists, we argue, we protest, at least some of us, protest against the fact that within the Roman Catholic writings, we find how they are exalting the papacy, and yet we're doing the same thing with Ellen White. That's what he's saying. Notice, how different the history of Christianity would be if we saw as our main task, not the struggle to protect our doctrines, but to be open in learning, always ready to, what is the word? Reevaluate everything. In other words, he's saying, let's question Let's reevaluate the writing of Sister White. When you reject the prophet, you reject God himself. You reject Jesus Christ himself when you do that. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 with me. Did God give us a prophet? Yes. Now, again, this is part of the signs of the times. As Christ mentioned, there shall arise false prophets in the last days, then at the same time, if there's going to be false prophet, then the real prophet must come under scrutiny. We are heading to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 14, verse 22. Notice carefully with me. The Bible says, Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But, what's the word? Prophesying serveth not for them that believeth not, but for them which what? which believe so if you don't believe what the prophet has said then the prophecy means nothing to you this is the reason why the majority of our churches do not talk about prophecies anymore because what we have lost the gift of prophecy we we don't have that interpretation anymore why it's because of this unity between the general conference of seven adventists and the Pope. That's the reason why you have to attack the prophet. That's the reason why we don't have the book Great Controversy. What do we have? We have the Great Hoax. Why? Because the book Great Controversy does what? It points out what the papacy has done in the past and is doing in the present and will do in the future. So therefore, we have to remove all of that from the book Great Controversy. You see? The Roman Catholic Church, in the later years of Sister White, they had said that they had already infiltrated all of the Protestant churches except Seventh-day Adventists. Why? Because of their prophet, they said. They said as long as she was still alive, they could not do it. They were waiting for her to die. And this is why she says, she was looking at the Alpha and the Omega, but she says when she saw the Omega, she says she trembled for our people. How we were going to be taken over by the Jesuits. Remember the vision she had when she was in Battle, uh, Battle Creek? Battle Creek there, the reference re means at the General Conference headquarters because that's where it used to be. She said she was there, she was sitting by the window and she saw some men coming towards the building. She said, I knew them well. The, meaning they were Adventist leaders. She said she was about to go open to open the door for them. Because she knew them well. She was about to open the door for them. Then she thought to take a second look. Then the scene was changed. Now all of a sudden those same men that she saw now were dressed like priests. Can you put the two and two together? That means we have seven Adventist pastors, but under their suit, they have a, a priestly collar. That's basically what she's, she saw. Then she said, those same men said, this property has been taken because you have been speaking against our holy order, meaning against the Pope. That's why they move, we move everything from the great controversy. 
What was being attacked? Her writings. Did you know that the book Great Controversy, after she spent uh, many nights without sleep under the inspiration of God to put that together, that then the, they refused to publish it? They did not want to publish it. When she gave them the book to publish, they did not want to publish it. That book was under attack the very moment <laughs> that she, was, she got done writing it. They did not want to publish it. And she said, in the last days, there will be hatred against the testimonies, which is satanic. That hatred is not coming from the Roman Catholic Church. She was talking about from within. From within. Notice another one here. This is Lawrence Siebel. He is the executive editor of what? Adventist Today. He posted this article, which is called Too Late for Jesus to come soon, part one, by Lauren Siebel, is an Adventist pastor, author of many publications and books. Now, the same pastor, Lauren Siebel, said that the Pope is not the Antichrist. I covered this last week. The Pope is not the Antichrist. This idea came from Ellen White, came from the Great Controversy book. The Pope is not the, he's not the only one. Many others have said this. I covered this a lot. Last time, you can uh, look for that video. I covered this. And at the same time, he wrote this recently, which was January 11th, 2020. He said this. Keep in mind, he was talking about the second coming. He says, here is the reason why it is too late for Jesus to come soon. Notice the reason why. He is mocking Ellen White. Notice what he says. One of the most spiritually depressing ideas is that Jesus has not returned because we are not good enough. Now, who said this according to him? Remember, he said this is a depressing idea. He quoted Ellen White. Well, this was published in a different language. This is why she is called Elena there. Elena White wrote, It is not God's will if the coming of Jesus is so delayed. For 40 years, Canaan's gate was shut down by the disbelief murmur and rebellion of ancient Israel. The same sins have delayed the entry of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. Not the promises of God have been wrong. Some have come to the conclusion that we need to be perfect. Notice what he's saying. Some have come to the conclusion that we need to be perfect for Jesus to return. Now, who is the some that he's referring to? Ellen White he's referring to. Christ, what is that? That's right. That's it. That's what she says in Christ's object lesson. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself among who? Among his people. When we perfectly reproduce the character of Christ in us, what would happen? He will empower us to finish the work. As a matter of fact, what she said there is exactly what Revelation 18 1 says. She did not say something new. This is what Revelation 18, 1 says. I saw another, another angel come down from heaven with what? Great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. What's the glory? It's the character of Jesus Christ. It's the same thing she said. Nothing new. But she, he said again, notice. He said, some have come to the conclusion that we need to be perfect for Jesus to come or to return. He's marking the prophet. Then he again said, Ellen White's statement, when Christ's character is fully revealed to his people, he will come to declare them as his own, has sparked the latest generation theological movement. People are trying to become what? Complete in order to what? To compel Jesus to return. You see how he's mocking the prophet? Now, what he's saying here is exactly what Desmond Ford has been teaching. Desmond Ford believed, well, he passed away now, used to believe that there is no such thing as a sanctuary. Now, this is exactly what he's teaching here. If there is no su such thing as a sanctuary, you know, there is no such thing as well as victory over sin. That's what he's teaching. We don't need to overcome sin to make it to the kingdom. But the, my Bible tells me 
the same message that John the Baptist was preaching, remember, make his path straight, not crooked. You know, we have some preachers within the so-called Protestant churches that are saying, don't worry about the sin problem. When Christ comes, he will sort the, the sin problem out. Don't worry about it. That's a great deception. We must overcome sin. I, I shared this to some of you before. I was attending church service one time. I visited this church some years back. And this pastor, whom I know very well, he was preaching on the Beatitude, Matthew chapter 5. Then at the end of his message, he said, we don't need to overcome sin because Christ overcame sin for us. And I said, what? And I looked around to see if anybody was protesting as I was protesting. Nobody protested. As a matter of fact, after he was done, people were saying, that was a great sermon. I'm like, wow, great sermon, really. He put something in there that will make you feel like, you know what? You can go party out there right now. Christ will understand. This is exact same thing. Mocking the prophet. Notice he goes on to say, in reality, this means, notice, if we have to be perfect, this means that Jesus cannot return to end the sexual abuse of children, the horrors of wars, the floods, and the spread of the Ebola virus. He probably would, but he cannot come because one small denomination of 20 million followers has not yet from the menu, the what? The menu, all the bad products, the what? And has not made perfect Sabbath observance. Mocking the prophet of God. But did she prophesy that there was going to be such an attack against the prophetic gifts? Notice, from volume 5 of the testimony, 664. If you lose what again? Confidence in the testimonies. What would happen? You will drift away from Bible truth. Notice, what else? Next, she says here, in volume 4 of the testimony, 211. It is Satan's plan to do what? To weaken the faith of God's people in the where? In the testimonies. Next follows what? Skepticism. In regard to the vital points of our faith. What else? The pillars of our position. Then what would follow? Then doubt as to the Holy Scriptures. And then what follows? The downward march to what? Perdition. So if you start scrutinizing the spiritual gifts, then you will also have no faith in the Bible, then you are heading on a path that leads straight to perdition. Are we seeing this among us? Notice. When the testimonies which were once believed are doubted and given up, Satan knows the deceived ones will not stop at this and he redoubles his efforts till he launches them into a what? Open rebellion which becomes incurable and ends in what? In destruction. If this open rebellion is incurable and leads to destruction, then should we call a people out of that? Should we call a people out of that? Yes. The general conference, is, as Sister White prophesied, is a sister to Babylon. Let's look at some passages here. The gift that has been rejected. For example, in Proverbs chapter 29, Verse 18, the Bible says, where is no vision? What happened? The people, what happened to the people? The people perished. Now let's turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29. Notice what the Bible tells us. When there is no vision, the people perish. And that is the plan of the enemy. The enemy knows if he gets weed or places doubt upon the spirit of prophecy, then the people will be heading on this path down to perdition. We are in chapter 29 of Isaiah. Notice in verse 10. For the Lord hath poured out upon you, the what? The spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seer, hath he what? Covered. And the vision of all is become unto you what? As the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, With this I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is what? 
it is sealed. In other words, brothers and sisters, there will be a famine within Seventh-day Adventist denomination for the Word of God because they have rejected the prophet. We are in the Laodicean state where the Bible says they are blind. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, the Laodicean condition of the church. You, did you know that it was never God's will for us to be in this Laodicean state? God wanted us to be in the brotherly love, which is, which is the Philadelphia state. The passion for the word of God. Chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. The Bible says in chapter 3, are you there? Verse 18, I counsel thee to what? To buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. You know the eye salve there, you know what it represents? Huh? The Holy Spirit, but keep in mind, it, it's, it is the spirit of what? Of prophecy. The eye salve represents the Holy Spirit. It represents the gift of prophecy as well. It is what God has given us to help open our eyes. Now, the next part of this we are going to look at here may shock some of you here. Now, the Bible says a prophet speaks for God, right? Is a spokesperson for, for the Lord. And as we read a moment ago, as a matter of fact, let's go back to that passage there. This is found in the book of 2 Chronicles right here. The Bible says, Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. And what else? Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. So God counseled us to believe his prophets because he was the one who raised those prophets. We need to respect, have respect for those prophets, right? Because they are the spokespersons for, for the Lord. Like Moses, for example. Moses spoke with God face to face. If you disrespect Moses, if you don't believe what Moses says, then it's like you have disrespected God and don't believe God himself. Now, in light of that, if you were, notice carefully with me, if you were, to put a play together or a film together about our beliefs, our teachings, about our movement, Adventist movement, would you be very careful in choosing someone to play the role of Ellen White? Would you be very careful about that? You would want to know if that person is an Adventist, right? That would be the first thing. If that person is an Adventist, and if they are an Adventist, and what is their belief about Ellen White? Amen? You would want to know those things. But what if I were to tell you, notice on the screen, you remember this? Tell the world the inspiring story of the Seventh-day Adventist Church official film. This is, you've heard of this, right? You've never, you didn't, some of you didn't hear about this, right? No, okay. This is a film that the General Conference put out that came out in 2016. You can watch it online or on, in YouTube for free. It's on YouTube. This is a film that's supposed to tell the story of the Advent movement from William Miller and all the way down to Ellen White, from the great disappointment and all the way down to the gift of Ellen White. Now, on the screen here, this is the young lady that they have chosen. Now keep in mind, the General Conference put, out, put this out. They, they spend about $5 million to make this film. And they were the ones who selected the cast. Those who will be the actors who will be playing the roles of Ellen White and the others in the movie. So they were responsible for that. Now this young lady here, who do you think she is? Do you think she's an Adventist? Not even close. Notice, before we get to that, 
This is from Adventist Review. First ever historical drama tells Advent story. Tell the world is the first historical drama to tell the story of the early history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The cinematic feature shares the Adventist story through a team of some 97 who are they? Professional actors. Now, that does not sound good so far. Professional actors? That means they were not Adventists. Notice. And over 1,000 extras. The $5.5 million film was an initiative of the Australian Union Conference. And who else? Major funding came from the South Pacific Division and the where? The General Conference of the Seven Adventists. Sponsored by your tithe money. To pay those worldly actors. Notice carefully. Who else supported this and applauded this whole thing? Mark Finlay, General Editor for Adventist Review, welcomed those present at the screening. When you watch it, the films grounds you in Adventist history. Many young people, he said, have lost their sense of identity. Keep those words in mind. Many young people have lost their sense of identity. When you get done, all you can say is thank God for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because of that film. At, who is promoting this? Mark Finley. Now, the main character in that film, as you see in the picture there, would be that person who played Ellen White. Ellen White would be the main character future, being featured in that film. Now, who is that lady, that young lady, who played the role of Ellen White? Let's go here to this website here. The film and cast, it shows some of the actors, their real name. And the young lady who played the role of Ellen White, her name is Tommy Ember. Now, who is she? Now, let me play this for you. She will share some of what God has blessed her with of late. Ms. Harmon. I was in prayer at the house of Mrs. Haynes in Portland. I lost consciousness and I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I rose high above the dark world, and I looked for the Advent believers, but I couldn't find them. A voice, an angel, said to me, Look again, and look a little higher. I then saw a straight and narrow path far above the dark world. The Advent people were traveling on a path toward a bright and a holy city. There was light behind the believers, which the angel told me was the midnight cry. This is the inspired testimony of God. The message we bear is a worldwide message. This was just a short clip from the film as she was representing Ellen White. But as I asked the question, who is that young lady that they had playing the role of Ellen White? Let's look at another clip here of that young lady, but this time from another movie. Notice. This is the same young lady there. We just saw playing Ellen White. This is from another movie that she's also in. There she is smoking and barely dressed on the streets. I, I take out the sound for this one because we don't need to hear what they're saying right now. 
That's her. That's the same lady that the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists had chosen to play Ellen White. There she is there in that bar. And there she is there in that same movie, which is called The Go-Getters. This is that same lady that we have chosen to play Ellen White that showed disrespect for the prophet of God. We are indeed on this downward path to perdition. We are disrespecting the prophet of God. You would pick a, a person from Hollywood? As a matter of fact, I'm going to shock you even more. This is not even it, what you are seeing here. And there were things about this movies, about this young lady that was so graphic, I could not put them on the slide. Porn movies. They had chosen her to play the role of Ellen White. Notice, this is from Advent Messenger, December 17, 2019. What, what is the headline here? Orgy, lesbian actress, played the role of Ellen G. White in the Seventh-day Adventist film, Tell the World. So what exactly are we telling the world? Now question, what is exactly are we telling the world? We are telling the world there's no difference between them and us. If we're going to bring somebody from Babylon, deep into Babylon, you notice what the headline says, orgy lesbian. This lady has been in many movies and all of the movies, after we found this out, based on my research, all of the movies that she was in, they all has to do with sex. All of the movies. And this is not just like, you know, basic thing. We're talking about almost pure pornographic movies. All of them. Notice, it says here, at the center of the tell the world movie is the story of Ellen G. White, prophet and co-founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Actress Tommy Ember was selected to play the role of Mrs. White. Tommy Ember is also an established actor, writer, and director who has appeared in orgy, lesbian, and gay movies. This is the image. This is what we're telling the world. Which gospel is this? This is the gospel of the papacy. They've been made drunk by the wine of the papacy. Notice, next picture here. In this picture, this is her right here. This is her in this movie, and she's at a bar. This is another lady here, and this is another lady. Guess what they're doing? Let's read. In 2016, while Tommy Ember was dressing up like Ellen G. White and getting paid by the church to make this evangelistic Seventh-day Adventist movie, she was also seducing women in a lesbian bar during the filming of Below Her Mouth, that's the name of the movie, the very same year. As I asked the question in the beginning, if you are going to make a film about our history, and especially if you're going to have someone playing the role of Ellen White, and by the way, we were told we should never get into fear, theatrical things like that. But Yet, we got into it, but nevertheless, you would have to show respect. You would have to check the background of that person. Would you go out there, think about this, would you go out there, let's say you have children, right? Small children. And uh, you need to go out, let's say to work or something like that. You cannot bring your children, re children with you. And you need somebody to watch them. Would you just go out there and pick anybody? To watch your children? Would you do that? Would you do that? No. You, you know, the answer is no. You would not do that. You would want somebody that you know, somebody you trust, somebody you know about their background to watch your children. That's the same thing we should have done here. But it was not about respecting the prophet. It was about more mocking the prophet. Notice next, it says here, 
the 2016 movie Below Her Mouth contains several lesbian sex scenes. Tommy Ember is on the right 2016. Tommy Ember right is dancing in a lesbian bar. The same year that this lady was shooting this movie. And then he, he was, she was also in the same thing. I kind of blocked some of these images because they're too bad to show here, but you could see her smoking and this movie had to play an orgy in a small town. There she is here again, smoking. Same lady who is playing the role of Ellen White. Let's move on here, next quote. There she is now in 2015 and 16, communicating with the spirit world. This was the wonderful actress who the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church chose to represent the prophet of God, Ellen White. And she is in what? Witchcraft, spiritualism. And there is another picture of her here in that same movie. She is possessed with demon playing a werewolf, demon possession. You see how they have insulting the spirit of prophecy, the gift of prophecy. Notice what Sister White says. Volume 1 of Selected Messages, page 48. What is it again? The very last deception. What is it? The very last deception of Satan will be what? To make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Where there is no vision, what happened to the people? The people perish. Proverbs 29, 18. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies. For what reason? To unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. But if you talk about this, you are the ones who are troubling the church. They call you the troublemakers. But what did she say? It is the straight testimony that is going to cause a shaking within the church. The straight testimony. Again, would you let allow anyone to come and babysit your, your children that you know nothing of? Would you allow a person with that background to babysit your children? No. We should have the same respect for God. We have moved away, far away, from the pillars of our foundation. As she prophesied, this movement, the General Conference is on the path to perdition. And sadly, many are going down the path with the General Conference. But we need to look unto Jesus. Amen? This is why I always counsel people, study for yourself. Spend time in the, in the writing of Sister White. Spend time in the Bible. Because Jesus says, go to the book of John chapter 5 with me. When we spend time in both the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, you know what you will find? Notice carefully, in John chapter 5, this is the counsel that Jesus gave here. Remember, we started reading this passage here. Jesus was talking about that he is the greater light, that John the Baptist was the lesser light. He says in verse 36, But I have great, greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father have given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father have sent me, and the Father himself, which have sent me, have borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he have sent, him he believe not. Notice, here is the appeal. Search the what? The scriptures. What will you find there? For in them ye think ye have what? Eternal life. And they are they which does what? Testify of me. When Christ said, search the scriptures, what else he is referring to as well? The prophets. The scriptures were written by the prophets. Search the scriptures. These are they which what? As he says there. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which does what? Testify of me. But then he says, notice. And ye will not come to me that ye might have what? 
life because they have rejected the prophets. That's what he said in Mark chapter 20, or not Mark, Matthew chapter 23, that they have killed the prophets of God. They have rejected the prophets of God. But again, the scriptures point to Jesus Christ. We need to spend time in both the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy because in them we will find Jesus Christ. Notice what Spirit of Prophecy went on to say. Patriarchs and Prophets, 356 and 357. A reformation must go through the churches. Reform must be made. For spiritual weakness and blindness were upon the people who had been blessed with great light and precious opportunities and privileges. As reformers, they had come out of the denominational churches, but they now act a part similar to that which the churches acted. But notice, we hope there would not be the necessity for a what? Do you get the context here? She had hoped there would not be another coming out. Now, if you think about it correctly, she's making an appeal. She's trying to direct them to the right path, as Jeremiah was doing, calling the people in chapter 6 of Jeremiah to the right path. And she explained how the reformers came out of errors to follow the, the light, the greater light, which is Jesus Christ. Now she said she hopes that there would not be another coming out. But because of the apostasy, there have to be a coming out of the General Conference to form self-supported Seventh-day Adventist groups so that we can continue to point people to the greater light as John the Baptist did. That's the reason why he was in the wilderness, pointing people to the greater light. Amen? He could not do it within the organization. He came out, he was in the wilderness crying out, and the Bible tells me that people were coming out to him because they were hungry for that greater light. Let us point people to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Let's pray. Loving Father, our God, which art in heaven, thank you again for the little light that you have given us through the writing of Sister White to help us to understand and to see the greater light a lot better. Father, thank you for giving us what you see that we needed for this time. And because of the light that has been given unto us, we have no excuse. Help us to walk according to the light that you have imparted unto us. And as Isaiah chapter 60 says, to also rise and shine and share the light of Jesus Christ to this dying world. And as we also read in Revelation chapter 18, we need to be empowered by the light of Jesus Christ and to shine the glory, the character of Jesus Christ to this world. I pray for your people, wherever they, they are, that you will cause a shaking among the, the churches so that the faithful few among them, their eyes might be open to see that greater light. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you.